The decision we will make for our country is a choice between the past and the future. and thanks so much for joining us. I want to start by talking about Jeremy Corbyn. Before September 2015, he was largely an unknown entity to much of the Australian left. Who is he and what does he represent? Well, Corbyn is a lifelong, natural left social democrat. I mean, it's since, I mean, you could the famous picture of him being arrested outside the South African embassy for protesting against apartheid. In the 80s, when I joined the Labour Party, you know, you'd go to a Labour conference and every good cause would be, you know, there'd be Jeremy Corbyn on the platform, whether it was Kurdistan or whether it was human rights in another global South country. But, you know, it's fair to say that, you know, the, the, the turning point for Corbyn and for many on the Labour left was the Iraq war because Corbyn stood up and said, you know, informed by many uh, you know, good sources, that it's all a lie. You know, they're, 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 you're being taken to war on a lie in an unconstitutional way by Tony Blair. Now, you know, what really finished Blair was the Iraq war. What has destroyed a lot of confidence in politics in general in Britain is the Iraq war. And Corbyn was the leading voice in the anti-war movement that stood up and said that. So, you know, if we then fast forward to you know, two election defeats for Labour, 2010, 2015. 2015, I would argue, self-inflicted because of our position on the Scottish referendum. We backed the Tory drive to keep uh, Scotland in Britain, um, fronted it up, and then lost maybe, you know, well, we lost 48 out of 49 MPs in Scotland, only got one left. Um, so we lose 2015 election, and the membership just basically said, I mean, a lot of very good centre-left candidates stood. It wasn't like the people who were standing were all pro-Iraq war. But a lot of you know, the membership just said, we can't go on in the old way. We can't go on trying to sort of look at the priorities of neoliberal capitalism and then crafting a kind of message that, that tries to garner as many votes while effectively as we can, while effectively implementing privatization, marketization, um, carrying on, you know, whittling away at trade union rights. We just can't do that anymore. Because I mean, Corbyn didn't expect to win. I know that he expected to come second. And uh, he won because the membership just didn't want any more centrism from Labour. Now, that's a shock to Australian Labour. It more or less is a centrist party. It would see most of us in, on the Corbyn movement as, as quite different politically. So that's who he is. But, I mean, surely, uh, you know, there's this wave of anti-establishment, radical social democracy you know, sweeping the globe right now. We saw it sort of grassroots, seated with Sanders, then, uh, you know, France, France uh, yeah. uh, Benoit Hamon right yeah. now uh, in, in France, Podemos. Where does Corbyn sit in with those dynamics and, and what's driving those generally? Okay, well, there's two things. One is the emergence of radical left parties where social, demo, social democratic parties just haven't been capable of moving to the left at all. They're just sitting there saying the system's fine, you know, support the banking system, carry on privatising everything. And, and, and social democratic parties that do that are tending to just collapse. Uh, the Spanish social democrats are basically in the process of collapse right now. The Greeks are already gone. So you've got these you know, Podemos in Spain, Syriza in Greece, new left parties with about 20, well, Syriza as a government, 35%. Now, in response to that now, in the last two to three years, I think we have seen shifts to the left inside European social democracy. Corbyn was a big signal. Um, he's dragged a lot of other people to the left inside British Labour. They felt more confident uh, that you can then go out and, and speak to people. Uh, I'm on uh, winning the, the French Socialist Party is irrelevant because I think uh, we've got to, we've all got to get behind Macron and try and defeat Le Pen and defeat Fillon so that the choice isn't between two Putin pu puppets for the French people. Uh, but um, even in, the crucial one is German Social Democracy. Uh, the German Social Democratic Party is now itself feeling its way to a connection. But the problem we all have is this. What, are we, what we're connecting with when we connect with something we might call radical centre-leftism is effectively the Salariat. The Salariat wants a green planet. It wants uh, social justice. 
It wants uh, gay rights, women's rights, transgender rights, rights for indigenous people in a, in a country like Australia. Um, at the same time, you've got this radicalization of white manual workers in the opposite direction. And Corbyn's problem, and your problem, is going to be uh, how do you construct an alliance that heads off some of our working class foot base from going ultra right? That's the difficult uh, thing. And, uh, and the answer is, you know, in two, two sentences, you embody the values of the progressive salariat, because that's who the members are now of, of Labour. That's the overwhelming who the membership are, where Labour's electoral base is. But you then have to offer to working class people and, and explain it in their own language, something very radical economically, and that is you know, the alternative what the right, to what the right says. You've got to offer them jobs. You've got to offer them decent jobs, a place for their kids to live, you, a transport system that gets them into turn if there is a job. Basic stuff, which I'm afraid in the Blair years, certainly in Britain, Labour was not really able to offer. It could just say, look, rise up out of your uneducated manual work culture or stay there. And we have to just say something much more hopeful to small town working class communities. So uh, on that, I mean, rel relatedly, I don't want to open the entire trove of post-Brexit yeah. politics well, right now, because all the glory and gore of, of yeah. your commentary can be read and watched online. But I, but I do want to ask a question about immigration as it yeah. applies in an Australian context. As a rule, can the left uh, afford to reconcile traditional social democracy mm. with a progressive immigration platform without losing its electoral base? No, I absolutely think it can. And look, I don't think there's a straight read-off from, from Brexit to the Australian situation. My critique of the Australian government and successive Australian governments is their, frankly, inhuman position on refugee uh, rights. Refugee, you know, refugee rights are paramount because they are, because they are written into the Geneva Convention and the Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights. You cannot do and support what the Australian governments have been doing to you know, sticking people out on islands. But you can entirely support, I think as a social democratic party, a, a economic migration program that says we put the economic rights of our own citizens at the center of it. There's nothing reactionary or racist about doing that. Um, no, we would then have arguments about how many, uh, you know, how many and where you design you, the, the, the new economic migrants are. I mean, Australia is a country that I think could, you know, really expand its GDP by importing people if it wanted to. Um, and and in, in, in effect, like Canada, it, that's what it has been doing. The problem you have is that lots of people living out in small, uh, predominantly white, small, manual working class towns don't realise how rapidly Australian cities have changed. And as they realise, you, you're getting, and I think you're, you're going to get, this kind of shock of the new. And we've had that shock of the new in the United Kingdom for, for 30, 40 years. And social democratic parties address it by saying, you know, ev once you're here, everybody's equal. There's no white supremacism in our doctrine whatsoever. But, you know, we, we have a policy of, you know, basically designing migration designing economic migration policies in, in, in ways that, that, that benefit everybody. Migrants benefit from migration, economic migrants. And we need to make sure that, for the most part, the, the, the people already here also benefit. Now, the problem in Brexit was, actually, it, and people need to be really clear about this, was nothing to do with Asian or African Caribbean migration. 18% of black Caribbean people voted for Brexit. 27%, according to one exit poll, of Asian people voted for Brexit. These are the taxi drivers. These are security guards. And what they're saying is the same as the white you know, people are saying, which is unlimited Euro East European migration. It seems to be unfair to us because our only means of redistributing wealth in Britain are the health service, which is free, education, which is free. Um, and, and people basically bought, I think, a lot of racist lies, which we needed to combat. But the ultimate problem was... We couldn't explain how complete freedom of movement, which is all in one direction from Eastern Southern Europe into Britain, was unmitigatedly good for British people. It is if the person coming in is a nurse. It is if the person coming in is coming in to do a skilled job in the private sector. But we created whole industries that could only exist because of an unlimited supply of cheap labor. 
And it's always been a working class and labor movement uh, position to say, that's not right. Now, we signed up to free movement. Labor Party signed up to free movement. We're in the European Union. As long as we're in it, we defended it. And we did defend it. But now, I mean, we're going to leave the European Union within two years. It will be over. And our challenge is to design something that re... So let's put it this way. We have to rekindle and rebuild support for mass economic migration. Because we need it. We need a young population. But we lost consent for it. And we have to take some of the blame for that. From an organising perspective, I mean, I mean, uh, problematically is not just the, the the way policy is written, because I, I think there's this perception on the ground that whether it be you know, the assumed freedom of movement within the European Economic Community, four five sevens in, mm. in in Australia, they're very much part of the neoliberal project. Yeah. They're very much part of the boss's agenda. On the ground, I mean, how do we change those perspectives? Well, look, I, I'm not, I'm not 100 uh, percent on top of the details of the 457 situation. I know there is a labour movement critique of it that says it's cheap labour that only serves the bosses. Um, that was the UKIP right wing critique of uh, unlimited free movement. But you, then you, you basically have to say you have to be quite clinical with people and say no, actually, you know, there is at a time when economic growth is is low in the world then importing people is a way of, 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 of stimulating economic growth, if that's what you want to do. The key thing is to have arguments about, and, and have not just arguments, demonstrable proof about how the, how the rest of us benefit from migration, from an open world, from an open society. Um, there's no one form that we should be wedded to, however. And I think you, know, you could see a Labour government in Australia or a Labour Green coalition like you had before coming in and saying, right, OK, well, now let's redesign the economic migration system. But, you know, that would not be my first priority. My first priority would be to reverse the inhuman positions on, on refugees. And my, my priority in the UK right now is to say, before when we re redesign our, our new post-European uh, migration system, which I want to be very welcoming. I, at, the, at the very heart of it, it, there has to be human rights for refugees. Because think about it. The whole... I've stood in Melilla, which is part of Morocco. There's a, a three-mile enclave of Spain in Africa. Not many people know this. And as a result, there's a three-metre razor wire fence, which I've seen Africans climb over with their, with their bare hands. The price of free movement is that fence. Now... I want to be fairer to genuine refugees who come and are fleeing persecution and war and starvation than we've been. And I would ask the Australian Labour Movement to think very carefully about prioritising the rights of refugees. In your most recent book, Post-Capitalism, A Guide to uh, Our Future, you uh, position yourself within a lineage of economists who over the past 200 years have predicted the uh, inevitable death mm. of the capitalist system. Why is the most recent mutation of capitalism, in your, in your opinion, uh, different to anyone that we've seen previous? Well, whether it's Marx or Adam Smith, what they got wrong was to predict a simple process of disintegration for, of capitalism. Remember, Adam Smith was very pessimistic about capitalism's survival. Uh, we now have systems theory. We now have the theory of complex and adaptive systems. And I think that the ultimate complex adaptive system is capitalism. That's why when we on the left say, look, you have to imagine a position where capitalism doesn't exist, the kind of right often say, yeah, but you know, it always survives. Well, yes, it does always survive until now. And it survives because technological innovation can create new jobs, uh, new uh, skills, higher wage jobs, uh, new complexities of human life. My argument, is, in a nutshell, is this particular wave of technology, information technology, certainly creates new complexities, certainly creates better uh, things for human beings. You know, to go from uh, uh, 10,000 moving parts in, a, in, a, in, a, in an internal combustion uh, automobile to 150 moving parts in an electronic, uh, completely electronic Tesla car is progress. Good. The problem is it doesn't create any jobs. It creates less jobs, it destroys jobs, and I'm in favour of that process. I'm in favour of heightened productivity for the human race, so we don't have to work. My argument is capitalism is going to find it very difficult to deal with that process, because every previous adaptation created new and better jobs. This one won't.
And so we have to work out, and I think it's for social democracy to join in this debate, what comes next? And if what comes next isn't a utopia, it's a transition, a controlled transition. So uh, according to your theory on, on transition, wage stagnation, growing inequality, Brexit, Trump, Greece, are all signs that neoliberalism is not going to, to die quietly. Uh, how do, to quote a post-capitalist from history, what is to be done? How do we yeah, smooth I mean, the transition? First thing is, I think the crisis of neoliberalism is one that, that could be short, solved short term if we'd have taken action after 2008, and if we still took action now, it's not going to lead, lead to the collapse of capitalism. But I think you know, eight years of seeing the global elite refuse to take those measures. So Germany, Germans, you know, political elite refuses to reflate the economy. The Eurozone imposes 40, 50% youth unemployment in a place like Greece, 25% youth unemployment in a place like Spain. You see the, these elite politicians, they're blind. They have no idea. And now they're reaping the whirlwind. See, I think Trump is not a continuation of neoliberalism. We learned when communism collapsed what a collapsed communism looks like. It's a, it's a nationalist authoritarian kleptocracy. Rich mafiosi take over. And we kind of, it, it happened in enough countries for us to conclude, I think, this is the natural default state of a post-Stalinist you know, communist society. Trump shows that the default state of a failed neoliberalism is going to say, be the same thing. Something about modern society makes it very easy for kleptocratic millionaires billionaires to take over and then progressively abolish the rule of law. So um, we have two things to do. We have to defend what we can of globalism. Uh, I'm not going to join the anti-global you know, rush to national solutions uh, yet. We have to defend what we can. And I think it is defensible. You know, we've got lots of multilateral institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, the World Trade Organization. You know, we, sh we need to the workers' movement, labor movement, need to defend these things, the Human Rights uh, Treaty. But we have to retreat a bit from them to do it. I mean, you look at it, TTIP, uh, the TPS, the, the, the Trans-Pacific Agreement, are, are over. That's a retreat. It's a retreat in response to people's just saying, enough, enough globalization. Now, we have to bear in mind, however, that what happened in between, say, 1931 and 1933 was the breakup of a global system. And if you, you know, you, you can, you, you, you retreat reluctantly, but at the, if at the end of the process, you're recognizing a series of facts created in the world, like Trump de-globalizes de the world, uh, declares economic war on China, Japan joins in, Australia's sitting there at the bottom of the Pacific, you know, South Pacific Ocean, watching all this go on, then the policy of a socially just left party has to be focused around its own nation. And the lesson from history is we're not there yet, and I'm not advocating we do anything yet, but our thinkers in the labor movement have to, uh, and in my own way, I include myself here, uh, have to start answering the question, what would we do if Trump and the Chinese bureaucracy and Eurozone uh, in, in a fragmentation situation actually breaks up globalization? It's a really tough question for your generation because you can't imagine it. You've grown up with a totally global world. You know, uh, the idea of like in the 1930s where if there was a hit record in America, it had to be remade in Britain by a different band because it was actually not allowed to export the record, um, then you, you can't imagine that. But unfortunately, if we don't win, then we're going to have to start, as it were, adapting social democratic politics towards new fragmentary, fragmentary reality post-globalization. But, but that being said, you're not completely anti-globalist. No, I mean, absolutely. I am pro-globalist. Right. I, am, I am in favor of defending as much as we can, including as much as we can of free movement in the, United, in the EU. My proposal is that we go to the European Union, Labour, and say we want to make, remain in the, in the economic uh, area, the, the single market, and for the price we are prepared to pay is to keep as much of, as free movement as we can sell to our own electorate. See, that's not a nationalist position. Some people on the Brit in British left think, ah, oh, that's terrible, that's, I mean, I'd be called a racist for saying this. But all, what I want to do is keep the three million people already there, the Europeans, give them absolute right to stay, if necessary, citizenship, which would cost us a lot of money uh, in terms of pensions in future, and 
to then say free movement continues except for agency work. Uh, it, you can't just turn up and, and say, I, I think I might get a job. Um, I do that. I do that uh, in full knowledge that it's a retreat from the previous complete freedom situation. But we're going to have to do something because we, the, the coalition that delivered Brexit was working class conservatives who never vote for us, racist right wingers who meant some of whom have flipped from us to the far right, and our own people who are not racist. And if we stand back and say, oh, you're all racist, we're going to drive very good, ordinary, anti-racist working class people into the arms of racism, which I'm not prepared to do. You mentioned this nation's uh, regional partner, great regional partner, China. Yeah. What can we expect from, from China for the next 15 years? Well, I mean, you know, I've reported six times from China, and each time been there for more than a month. You wrote a novel. I wrote a novel yeah. about a British journalist being pursued across China by an irate, psychotic uh, Chinese bureaucrat, um, partially based on experience. Uh, so what do I think? I'm with the pessimists who study real figures about the Chinese growth. You know, if you, if you measure electricity consumption, then you could extrapolate from that, you know, that Chinese growth is, is slowing quite rapidly. Um, and that all the stimulus measures they take do work, but then you, the, 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 the basic problem remains of a slowing uh, economic giant. Uh, also one running out of cheap labor, running out of workers uh, because of the one child policy in the past. And I'm also incredibly worried about its financial system because you know, Canute-like, the, the Chinese bureaucracy stands there every so often, as they did at the beginning of 2016, saying, you know, the markets must rise. Let's, let's pump some more money in. But as a result, it's one of the most opaque form. I think it's a capitalist country. It's one of the most opaque capitalisms in the world. And you're not just, we're, nobody's sure that, um, that the levels of interconnectedness between Chinese banks and uh, the, le the leverage they have with each other can't blow up. However, I would say that the bigger problem is going to, is going to be Trump. You, the, the, in a way, whatever the Chinese do, the Chinese bureaucracy will have to mature uh, a little bit in its, to be able to cope with this kind of child throwing his, his toys out of the pram. Because they, they've never faced something like this before. They're actually quite placid and quite mature as a political leadership. They read all the books that left-wing members of the Aussie Labour Party would have read, you know, Marx. Yeah, they, they read it, Lenin, etc. And they, they know how to deal with kind of slightly idiotic uh, and mercurial people. But I would worry if Trump really makes good, and Steve Bannon, his chief of staff, makes good on the threat to start a war in the South China Sea, what you will then see is the Aussie elite will almost divide into a pro-China and pro-US uh, thing. It might actually break both, part, both sides of politics. Um, and I'd be, wanting to, I'd be wanting to think about that um, before I decided which one I was going to be in. Because uh, it's undoubtedly Australia's future, because the future of the world in the, in the Eastern Hemisphere is, is with China. Um, and yet, culturally, politically, you know, you know yourself because of the far, rise of the far right here, how unprepared Australian society is for that kind of final moment where the West is, is another country, if you see what I mean. Paul Mason, I might finish by asking, um, people watching this might not realise that beyond economics and radical social democracy, uh, you actually have a background in music. Yeah. If you could pick one song uh, to define these unprecedented times in which we are living, what would it be? Oh. To define the times. I almost can't. I almost I'm, what I'm hearing in my mind is a kind of hippie, new age, um, hand pan, steel drum type music, uh, zoning out music. Because I really think that what we've all got to do, especially people who are glued to Twitter, they'll their anxiety levels rising every morning as they read Donald Trump's crazy outpourings. Is listen to some really good new age kind of relaxation music. Who's going to need it? Well, I said thank you very much for joining us on Fabian's TV. A pleasure.